All right, good evening, everybody. This is the regular monthly meeting for the Downers Grove Grade School District 58 Board of Education on Wednesday, June 5th, 2019 at 7 p.m. at the Downers Grove Village Hall. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Doshi. Here. Member Hannes. Here. Member Harris. Here. Member Olchik. Here. Member Samanti. Here. Member Weiner. Here. And Member Hughes. Here. As a reminder, members of the audience will have the opportunity to provide public comment to the board during our reception of visitors later on in the agenda. The board asks anyone wishing to comment to please fill out a card and indicate the topic to be addressed. These can be placed in the basket over there on my right. All right, as we always do, we're gonna go ahead and start off the night with a flag salute. We ask that Dr. Kremascoli's family please help us uh, lead us in the pledge. Thank you for helping us out tonight. Uh, we greatly appreciate it, and we graciously, great, gratefully appreciate uh, you letting your mother dedicate so much time to us over the last seven years. Uh, we know that we can be very time consuming, so, so thank you. Um, and, and thank you to everybody who made it to our brief reception today. Uh, what a great opportunity it was to kind of talk and laugh and tell stories and, and just have an opportunity to say goodbye. So uh, we really, really appreciate uh, everybody making it out uh, today. Uh, before we get into our regular board business, we did want to start off by just taking this time to acknowledge Dr. Carrie Kremascoli and all the years of, of dedicated service that she's provided to Downers Grove. We have uh, several board members and some members that are out here in the audience, including former board members, that wanted to take an opportunity to say a few words. So with that, I would like to let Greg start us off. Oh, gosh, I get to start. Um, I don't... Um, I don't know what to say, Carrie. Um, I've been thinking about writing something down, and I'd just rather just speak extemporaneously because I think it's just more, um, you know, just the things I just want to say are pretty simple. Um, I love living in Donners Grove. I love living here because of our, for a lot of reasons, but the schools are something I'm so proud of as a community member, as a parent of two kids in our schools. This is such a great place to send our kids. And I know my wife, if she were here, she would say the same thing. And. You know, I, I see, like, just in, in the three years we've been, well, four, that we've been in, in the district, there's so many great things going on, and I just thank you from the bottom of my heart as a parent, as a board member, as a community member, for, all, for your part in all of that, and thank you for your leadership, and there's so many things that I hope you're really super proud of during your time here. Um, I'm, sure, I'm sure really glad to be just a small piece of that as a board member, but thank you for pushing everything that you've done to help kids, and, and thank you. There's so, many, there's so many things that we could say about you, but like the thing that is, comes through the most is you are all about kids. And thank you for that. Thank you for that from, from everybody. That's, that's so important to us as, um, as a community and, and as the board. Thank you for making everything about our kids. Thanks, Greg. I'll go next. Um, two and a half years ago, I uh, moved into the area my family and I did, uh, and I looked for an opportunity to get, to get involved in some way, shape, or form. And, uh, right at that moment, uh, Carrie and her team put out a message around joining the Superintendent's Community Advisory Council, and I thought that would be a great way to get involved. I uh, went to the first meeting, and I'll just say that the big thing that I want to say to about Carrie is how welcoming you've been. Um, from that moment, you, with open arms, said you just moved into the community, actually didn't live here yet, and you're like, yeah, you're welcome to serve however you'd like, and uh, welcomed it with me with open arms, so thank you for that. Um, two and a half years later, we're, we've been working together now for that long, and um, there's only a handful of people that get to see what you do behind the scenes, and uh, the thing that stands out most to me is uh, how committed and dedicated you are to the district and to our kids, as Greg said, uh, and how much you carry on your shoulders for the weight of every decision that happens in the district, whether it was yours or somebody else's. Um, Carrie will go to bat for anybody, and I know that you'll continue to do that in your new district. Um, and uh, you will never look for the credit for going to bat for those folks. And so um, I just want to say thank you for all you've done, and I wish you well in whatever comes up next. Thanks, Sarah. Um, <clears throat> I think when Samantha was in preschool is when you started. Um, and I couldn't have been more excited, as my whole life has been dedicated to the advocacy and inclusion of all. Um, 
what a wonderful way to be um, a role model for lots of people, but especially for our young women and young girls to see that um, you could be a strong um, leader for our school and show that um, there could also be a caring side to that. So I couldn't be more thrilled that Samantha is forever on um, video with you singing the 12 days of Christmas <laughs> from <laughs> kindergarten. Um, but just, I think that's one thing that has been really important uh, for me, um, as well as I told you this before when we met uh, for coffee the other day, that I think one of the, the greatest legacies is um, the, the administration and staff that you have hired to lead our district. Um, I, right now I feel like this is one of the strongest um, groups we've had as far as teachers and administration and um, I think we're gonna just knock things out of the park and that's all based on your um, decision making and hiring wonderful people. So thank you. Okay. Uh, at this time we'd like to invite anybody out there uh, in the audience that, that would like to make a, a comment. Mr. Miller. Here comes trouble. Here we go. <laughs> oh, no. Feels good being on this side. <laughs> you all thought I could say whatever I wanted when I was up there. Wait till I get out here a couple times. Okay, for the next half hour, I'm going to take you through a story. <laughs> no, I, I, Carrie, you will always hold a special place in, in, in my heart, in my family's heart. Uh, so will your family. Uh, and, and this will be an emotional farewell for me. Uh, you are, you've been a great superintendent. Uh, you care about kids. And what they've said, when people say um, you put kids first, you always did. And there were a lot of times when, you know, heat that you didn't deserve, you took it because you cared about kids. You didn't care what a special interest group had. You did what was right for kids. And you always will do what's right for kids. And there's been a number of times where I'm like, hey, why don't you just tell them who really is you know, doing this. And you're like, nope, the buck stops here. The buck always stopped with you. You made changes, you made hard decisions. And, uh, you know, not to embarrass my daughter too much, but there's a product of, of your supervision here. She was a pretty young, young student when you first came here. I remember her seeing you. She's always been impressed with you. Jill, you said it. She is a role model to my daughters. You're a role, daughter, or role model to my son too, but I think especially to, to my daughters. Of, of what they can accomplish. She's accom she accomplished a lot in District 58. She was well prepared for 99. She graduated and she'll be very prepared for St. Louis University in the fall. So if there's any testament of, of the great you've done and all the teachers and everybody that helped her through District 58 and be prepared, it's right there. And for you, whatever you did on the school board, whatever you do in your professional career, um, I don't think you've done anything better in your life than be a great mother here. Your kids are wonderful. We're going to miss them a lot. Um, you know, Kev, or, or Nevin and Jack are the same age. They play basketball together. Uh, you know, Francesca, I always call her Francesca, <laughs> always the wrong name. But Calia, you've just been a great friend uh, of Mary's. They're in the same grade. Um, and, and you just can't, that's what you need to be proud of, right? Be proud that you're here. Be proud of the things you do. And then the last thing that'll show how, how much I think people think of you is when Doug and I had a chance to go to the superintendent, the DuPage, it was the superintendent breakfast for DuPage County. Um, when you weren't around and I was talking to people, oh, where are you from, District 58? Everybody said, oh, you're losing a great one. Oh, what a great superintendent. Oh, and they just always had good things to say about you. So when your peers are saying good things about you, you got a family that turned out like that, you should be proud. And I'll, the last thing I'll say is, I've said it before, I said it in public, you're the best hire I ever had. Thanks, John. <clears throat> uh, so I've had the opportunity to work with you obviously in, in a number of different roles even before I was on the school board and then through my time with the school board and I know you and I have different 
recollections of the moment when Kyle and Kalia met up in that <laughs> playground. But, but the fact is, um, every interaction I've had with you, one of the things I come away with is the integrity that you bring to the job. And much as John said, when he went to the superintendent breakfast and met with your peers, uh, Darren and I had that same exact experience at the I conference. That every time you were with me, and obviously we attended a lot of sessions together, but what we'd hear is, you're so lucky to have Carrie. She does such wonderful things, and, and we're, we're, what a gift that is. And you know, we're standing up here and we're looking at the, the outcome of the strategic plan. And, and I know as we went through elections, a lot of the things we heard about was how wonderful it is that we have set the direction and we know where we're going. And, and I don't think you've gotten enough credit for the fact that it would have been easier as a superintendent to kind of ride out the last strategic plan. And instead, what you did was really bring to our attention and push that process and, and push us to become a better district. And I think you should be really proud of that. I think Kevin is going to do a wonderful job here, but I think Kevin is also stepping into a position with, that you have just done a tremendous job of preparing for him. I, I think we are at such a good spot, and, and, and I, I'm really hoping that you feel really good about that. And, and I, I'm sad you're moving on. I, I'm sad you won't be here. I, I won't be here that much longer either. Um, but um, I, I'm just really impressed with what you brought to the table, and, and I just, I've really enjoyed the chance to work with you, so. <laughs> All right, so I'm Valerie Hardy. I'm Rita Brzezina. And um, together we're speaking to one capacity that we have worked with Carrie. Um, it's been a couple of years now, but we were the president and vice president of the PTA Council um, for a couple of years there and had the chance to work with Carrie. Um, and I think we can say that that was the beginning of where we saw, besides you know, kind of in our personal interactions with her, we're also fellow Whittier families, um, how much of an ear she had open to listening to the parents in the community. And the PTA Council, for those who don't know, um, represents all of the district schools um, and the president and other leaders within the PTA. And Carrie always dedicated time, whether it was on a formal calendar schedule um, or whether it was just when we needed to kind of put her on call to ask a question, hey, people in the PTAs are wondering, dot, dot, dot. Um, we were never wasting her time. She was always willing to spend it with us to hear what the PTA had to say, take that information, digest it, and um, hopefully use that to fuel some of the work that was being done on the back end and then vice versa. The information she gave to the PTAs, we were able to take back and help you know, hopefully be a buffer sometimes to get information. There was a lot of misinformation um, out there and we were able to get that information from Carrie's mouth directly. She never sent you know, one of her um, fellow staff members. She always came directly and was willing to, um, to hear our voices and to share her perspectives back and we greatly appreciated that. I would just echo that. Every professional capacity I've shared on my volunteer end, but to your professional capacity has been full of integrity, full of love for our children. You will be missed by my whole family and all. And then I will speak to a couple other capacities. My paths have crossed with Carrie in many ways, um, you know, personally, which has been fun and great. And we never followed up with that second mom son game night that we always talk about. So I'm going to hold you to that still. We're going to do that even though you're crossing to the north side. Um, but professionally, I've also worked with Carrie as part of the superintendent's advisory um, and, and another great opportunity where, um, you know, with no barriers, open to all perspectives, and really genuinely wanting to know um, what the community thought. Um, and so I've greatly appreciated the opportunity to work with you in that capacity. Um, Carrie has also supported, I run the Intro to Teaching program at Downers Grove South, um, so my students go into the District 58 Southside Elementary and Middle Schools. Um, Carrie, at the you know top of the chain in District 58, has supported the program. She's come into my class and you know made herself so accessible to my students who are pursuing a future in education. And like other said before what a great role model you have been to students in the classroom and students who are looking to go to the other side and become teachers so thank you for all that you've done we are certainly going to miss you and your family um, but we wish you all the best and we know hopefully you will not be a stranger so thank you thank you Val. Thanks. <coughs> uh, 
Hello. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. No surprise, I'll be brief. Uh, <laughs> a lot of the sentiments have, I can echo uh, that have already been said, but I was fortunate enough to be on the board that, that hired you. Uh, you really stuck out in that hiring process, uh, even though you weren't a superintendent yet, uh, and you were going up against other people who were superintendents, and you stuck out then, and certainly we had high expectations, and you exceeded them. Um, one, one quick thing that I think wasn't covered that I, I've shared with you, but I think other people may feel but not know, but one thing I always respected was how you treated people uh, whose opinions maybe you didn't agree with or went against some of the things that were decided by the administration or the board. Uh, I think it's a very impressive that you continually look to build consensus, even with uh, ideas that probably are complete opposite of yours or nowhere near yours, but you always take the high road, always, to the point where sometimes it was frustrating that you were taking such a high road. But that, that certainly is one thing that, that I can learn from, and I think a lot of people just in life can learn from, but you have that trait down, and, and that's very commendable. Uh, that, and it doesn't need to be said, but the kids first, a lot of people talk about it, but you, you actually do it. So thank you very much. Much appreciated, and very sorry to see you go. Thanks. Uh, so I'm one of those people Doug was talking about that uh, sometimes we disagree. Uh, my name is Craig Young. I'm the president of the DGEA, the teacher union. And um, on behalf of the DGA, I want to say thank you um, for your hard work. Um, you are an incredibly hard worker. Um, teachers know how hard the job of any administrator is. There's uh, a reason my own Type 75 certification goes unused. Um, <laughs> But you are an incredibly hard worker. Um, if, if there's like a record for the most committee or council meetings <laughs> attended, I mean, you've got a good stake. I don't know if Guinness has that, but you'd have a good case for it. Um, we, we have, the Dr. Kremiscoli and the DGA have had disagreements at times. Um, and like any relationship, we've done our best to work through those. Um, but I have no doubt that you have done what you felt was best for kids for our district, for our community, uh, throughout your, your dealings here. Um, and uh, wish you all the best of luck in, in your future endeavors. So thank you. Thanks. Um, anybody else? Well, thank you. Um, I did want to take an opportunity to say a couple things as well. I will try to be brief myself, but first of all, I want to thank you for, for seven years of exemplary leadership. Um, you really, truly put your, your heart and soul into everything, not just inside the district, but, you know, it really means a lot that you've made Downers Grove your home. You know, uh, I'm going to be honest, change is very difficult. It's a hard thing uh, to go through, but it can also be very healthy and good and important to do that as well. And so I know that you're going to be very excited to spend time in um, District 39 out in uh, Wilmette, just as we'll be very excited to, to be bringing uh, Dr. Russell in here to District 58. But I do want to take the opportunity to thank you for just continuing that hustle right all the way up to the buzzer so that we're ready to kind of turn over uh, when July hits. I mean, that's, I'm, I'm really thankful for that. And I'm thankful for the fact that that you are truly leaving the district in a stronger place than it was uh, when you arrived. With all of that said, you are truly going to be missed. I have thoroughly enjoyed working with you over the last two years. And I have to say that your passion for the work that you do is truly infectious. I, I, I watch you, and it makes us all uh, want to work a little bit harder. I know that when you came into this district, it was also a time of tremendous change. And, and we saw a lot of things from um, major curriculum updates to uh, the implementation of Common Core and, and, and state mandates changing, including a new standardized test, which was incredibly popular here in Downers Grove. Um, multiple construction projects, as well as uh, you, you took leadership on, on two strategic plans. So you did this all, and you, and you led with grace, and you've always been a good steward of our district's finances. 
but to echo what I think has been the common theme, you were always, always putting kids first and really had a good, strong focus on, on student growth. So we, we greatly appreciate that. So I think really what it comes down to is on behalf of the board, I think we all just want to wish you and your family uh, best of luck in your new adventures and just want to thank you for, for seven years of dedicated service to Downers Grove. So thank you. Thank you. I, those of you who know me know that uh, these farewell things are the probably only time I get <coughs> super emotional, so I'm going to keep my comments uh, a little bit brief and just say that I am humbled and honored by the reception this evening, so thank you. It has been my privilege and my honor to serve here in District 58. Um, I'm really proud of the work that we've accomplished together. I am exceptionally proud of our teachers. I think we have the best teachers we could ever have. Uh, they work tirelessly for our students, for each other, for their administrators, and they truly are our biggest asset here in District 58. We also are very blessed to have incredible administrators, and um, we right now have a, an incredibly strong administrative team, and I want to thank uh, the administrators who are sitting over here um, by my side, who have been by my side throughout uh, seven years, and who work truly uh, unending hours to support the success of our district. Um, your dedication and your hard work has been uh, tremendous. Um, our principals are incredible and they too work hours upon hours and I think uh, too often go un unrecognized and underrecognized for the hard work that they do on behalf of our, our students and on behalf of our teachers and our, our parents as well, so thank you. Um, and then finally, to members of the board, past and present, thank you for your support. Um, thank you for your guidance. Thank you for your leadership. It is a thankless job that you do. And um, very often, uh, you um, have spent hours trying to learn about things that are new to you and recommendations we're making, trying to understand what the community is asking you to do. Um, and it's through your leadership that we've been able to accomplish so much. So um, on behalf of my family, we could not have made a better choice in coming here. So <laughs> there we go. So, <laughs> so thank you so much for everything. It's been my honor and my privilege. And thank you for being so kind to my family. Too. Thank you. Thanks again for everybody who came out to that reception and made it such a memorable night. All right, now we're going to go on to our non-action item reports. Uh, first, we're going to start with a recognition of students of the Safety Patrol and the Middle School Spring Athletes. And there's the mass exodus. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. All right. The board would like to formally recognize those students who have volunteered their time to participate in the Safety Patrol program. Thank you for your assistance in keeping your classmates safe and helping the school day run smoothly. We would also like to recognize those students who participated in spring athletics at Herrick and O'Neill Middle Schools. Congratulations on your successful season and thank you to all the coaches for your leadership. Next, we're gonna move on to our first spotlight on our schools with the strategic plan end of year report with Dr. Kremiscoli. <clears throat> So we thought it was a really good idea not to put together a presentation at which um, each of the assistant superintendents would have to get up and speak. Uh, now I'm regretting that choice because that means I, get, I have to give a brief overview. Um, but I am very proud to do so. So um, <laughs> the reports are provided online for our progress reports for this year. They summarize the growth that we have made with regard to our strategic plan in each of those three big and ambitious goals. At the suggestion of our district leadership team, uh, the reports are presented here. They're also on the online dashboard. Um, and so the district leadership team suggested maybe not a formal presentation would be necessary at this uh, evening's meeting. Um, but I would like to highlight a few areas of significant accomplishment in each of our three goals, um, just to kind of wrap up the school year and prepare for the upcoming school year. So, and it's a good thing I wrote down some notes uh, because otherwise I may not be able to 
speak as coherently, so I'll read from my notes. <laughs> um, so uh, the strategic plan was launched at the beginning of this school year um, after last year's long uh, community engagement process and planning and has truly guided our work throughout the school year. Um, we've had nine strategic plan councils, some of which I think Craig was referencing. Um, and uh, though each of those councils have really worked in a collaborative and consensus building process along with a myriad, and when I say myriad, I mean many, many committees, board committees, and other groups working to help guide the work of our strategic plan. Um, just to highlight a few, um, it, you, you'll see presented our um, infographic of um, our pursuit of excellence together through this strategic plan and I think most importantly in front and center is um, our our number one goal which is focusing on learning and we've made a ton of really significant improvements in our curriculum as our community and the board knows um, we've implemented uh, this year our new ELA resources across the district and we're seeing really good uh, results from that so far and getting lots of really good feedback too um, we've researched, piloted, and the board has adopted new um, science and STEM resources. We've identified new math resources that will be uh, piloted next year with the hopeful adoption for the following school year. Um, and most importantly, we've improved our processes for curriculum adoption and um, timelines through the work of the Curriculum Council. Excuse me, so thank you, Justin, for your leadership there. Um, we've created a definition of academic rigor that will help guide our work, and we've also made several improvements to our professional development planning, resulting most significantly in the development and approval of the professional development model for next year, which will give us that early release time. Um, we've also, and you'll hear just in a little bit, um, it's some of the work of the Instructional Models Review Council. Justin will summarize that as well. So we're making significant uh, progress in terms of uh, focusing on learning and we're really excited about that. In terms of goal two, connecting the community, we've taken a close look at our communication practices both internally and externally. We've looked at our strengths, we've looked at our gaps, and we've looked at exemplars from other areas. We strengthened some of our internal communications um, through tools such as the Inside Scoop. Um, our committee exit slips and our communications toolbox. We've implemented new strategies for external communication, such as video recording, as you see happening this evening, of our board meetings, our new family onboarding resources, and the strategic plan dashboard. Um, we've also, um, with Jane's leadership, um, accomplished quite a bit through the Resources Review Council, really looking at the decision making and communication of how we're using our resources. Um, our administrative team is looking at establishing those district-wide expectations for school communication and our communications feedback council has explored our current opportunities for feedback, collaborative communication, and strengthening those opportunities as well. So there is much more work to do in this regard, but thank you to Jane and to Megan for your leadership um, on goal number two. Your leadership has really been very significant in these regards. And then finally in goal three, securing our future. Uh, anyone who's been following us of late knows that we've been doing a ton of work here. Our facility planning council under the leadership of Todd Drayfall um, has really helped to um, evaluate our facility needs and our priorities, examine feasibility, and uh, set the stage for that long range planning that is so necessary for us. Um, throughout these efforts, we've sought feedback and input from our community. This is important work and needs to continue as we continue to build our long-range plan. I know that there are plans to consider that in July further. Um, we have, in terms of our timeline, we've completed steps one through five. Uh, we will be this evening hearing a little bit more about the Instructional Model Review Council, and then in July, the board will have the opportunity to be presented with some of those um, early cost estimates and some of the big ideas of the facility plan, and to have some discussion around that and around the next steps that will be necessary in order to bring forward to the board um, by September the first draft of the long-range plan. After that, we'll continue to get community engagement and feedback and refine those ideas so that by December we have a plan that um, can be presented and, and hopefully adopted by the board. So there's been really significant work in that regard. We've also continued to be good fiscal agents of our finances. We've presented a balanced budget for the upcoming school year and that is inclusive of a lot of additions of personnel, of professional development and of curriculum along with some technology. So. Um, balancing the budget is not an easy task and um, 
we have continued to grapple with some of those difficult decisions. So um, to Todd, but also to Jane and Justin and James, Jessica and Megan, Kevin, thank you so much for your support in helping to make sure that we can continue to balance the budget. So um, in summary, I think when we launch this plan, the board will recall, I talked a lot about these three really big ambitious goals, not, not entirely sure how we would be able to progress on, on accomplishment and I am exceptionally proud of the work that has been accomplished thus far and I know that we, we are really well poised for success in the future here in District 58. So um, the future is very bright here and I am proud to have just been a small part of that so thank you. With that there are reports online, there's the online dashboard, um, but I did want to take a moment and celebrate some of those successes and, and thank everyone for their hard work and contributions to uh, the progress that we've made. Thank you. Do you have questions? Carrie, thanks for the uh, overview. Uh, I think this is the strategic plan in and of itself is a testament to the strong work that you've done and where you're leaving this district in, in a great place. Um, so thank you for the report and the update. Uh, I had a question. Uh, <clears throat> last month we approved the role, or we saw the folks sit into the roles of the new curriculum coordinator and AP position, a uh, combined role that uh, is new for us. Um, I'm interested to hear from you or possibly from your team on how do we think about that role this coming school year and what we expect out of it so that before those folks are in the seat, we know here's what we're looking for to know that it's working. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you and I uh, talked about this just briefly before the meeting. Um, I think there's a job description that's been defined, but I think it will be really important work over the summer to really examine um, what those functions are. Obviously, that, that role will be built out as the school year progresses, um, but to have some further conversation about the ways in which we plan to evaluate the effectiveness of those positions, which I think, Karat, is, is what you're getting at, um, you're hoping to see um, in advance of of that August or September meeting so that we have some ways of really evaluating is this the best model there certainly are a variety of ways to get additional administrative support into the curriculum office but to really examine how can we do that how best can we use that resource and how can we evaluate that yeah it'd be mm -hmm. interesting it'd be helpful to see that um, I think at in July if, if possible or possibly August if needed okay. uh, just before that uh, those roles get up and running and are in seat and at that point, you're you're racing to get ready for the school year and, and whatever else. Yeah. So yeah, you got it. Um, I, I'm going to buy my team some time and say that probably August is going to be a better time for that discussion, um, especially because I know that in July we will have um, student assessment results being reviewed, um, and then we'll also have the discussion of facility planning, and um, that will be, I, I assume, a, a more lengthy and in-depth discussion for the board. So I'm I'm going to suggest probably August would be a great time to bring back some of those ideas of, of evaluation of those positions. Great, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Anything else? I'm probably jumping in, into the weeds on this one, but for the goal number three, uh -huh. um, step four, um, kind of the, the second to last sentence of the update is we're going to review initial cost estimates at the May 28th meeting with the Facility Planning Council. Correct. Did that, did that take place? It, it did. Um, and then what, what we decided was we wanted to spend a little more time reviewing and refining that before it was publicly presented at the board meeting. So um, that will be coming forward in July at the, um, at the July board meeting. Um, Todd and we wanted Kevin to be able to be part of that discussion as well to really talk through uh, what those costs are looking like. Um, there certainly will need to be some prioritization. There's no doubt about it. Um, a 10-year plan is a lengthy and, and almost all-inclusive plan um, we may need to prioritize and then also um, Todd is beginning to look at some of the financing options for that not all of it will be funded in the same way some dollars may come from health life safety some may come from bonds it, it, those are things that need to also be explored so um, yes to the facility planning council having reviewed it and the board will have a more in-depth review of that in July okay yeah I just want to make a note maybe we could strike that June 5th date just to make sure that this reflects reality because sure. it does say June 5th. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for catching that. We'll go ahead and edit that um, before it gets uh, finalized and published on the website. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. We have a second spotlight on our schools. We're going to do uh, take a look at the Instructional Model Review Council uh, with Mr. Sissel. Thank you. 
As Carrie mentioned, we're going to talk a little bit about one of these councils that is born of strategic planning. And this presentation is the first portion of what had been the community engagement sessions that have been happening over the course of the past month. The second portion of that was actually the spotlight that you saw from the facility planning council at the last board meeting. So this kind of wraps all of that up together so that we presented all of it both here and for our community. So the Instructional Model Review Council is made up of teachers, administrators, and parents. Uh, we've had five lengthy meetings between February and April. As we mentioned, it comes through goal one, and really the, the committee's charge is to think about instructional needs from a, a pedagogical, a developmental, and instructional lens. So where the Facility Planning Council is doing a lot of work around instructional needs from, a, from their lens, this group comes at it from that pedagogical, developmental, and instructional lens. And just to take a look at where this comes out of directly from the strategic plan, one thing worth noting is where it says timeline, um, the review was initially slated to begin next school year. And, and yet as the work of goal three progressed and as the work of the council, that council progressed, we recognized the need to bring this group to life even sooner to make sure that we didn't go too far down any one road with, with facility planning without the instructional considerations that really need to help drive the kinds of decisions we would make around those instructional delivery models. So at our first meeting, that group had a chance to take a look at the strategic plan, also to look at a, a general overview of district facilities, where our programs are, how they're delivered. We also, as you're aware, these were councils that we asked for volunteers to join. So we took a moment to think about what brought us to the table, because these are, these are hot button issues for people. And so we really needed to reflect on where, what our experiences are and what our preconceptions might have been around some of these models. We began focusing, the Instructional Model Review Council will have a lot more work to do in terms of really thinking about instructional delivery all the way from what does the building configuration look like down to what does the classroom experience look like for the individual student. The council began focused on that 6-8 middle school question and the middle school model because that had been directly called out by the strategic plan, so it was the logical first question for this group to tackle. Um, and so as we started to talk about that, we asked ourselves, what, what are we going to need to feel like we could make an informed decision? While we came to the table with some ideas and our own experiences, the question really is around what will help us to feel like we can make, if, if it turns into a recommendation or answering of questions, how will we know we're doing that well and from a well-informed perspective? And so obviously, research came up quickly as, as something that the, the council wanted to delve into quite a bit of. Um, we also talked about the idea that at some point, we're going to talk about values and how those values are arrived at for ourselves and our stakeholders in our community and recognize that there are going to be a variety of perspectives as we go through the process. So that was the first sort of get ourselves organized and then become a functioning group sort of meeting. We then dug into research and, and this group of people read quite a bit, um, articles upon articles, study upon study, First focusing on the academic impact of school design. What kinds of outcomes do we see based on the configuration of schools? Looking at middle school, but also school configuration in general. We then focused a little more on middle school practices. There's a, a, a sort of meta study called Why Some Schools Do Better, which really looks specifically at not necessarily configuration differences, but the kinds of practices that happen in middle level education and what impact that has on academic outcomes. We then started to have some conversations around the, the reality that there's more to this than academic outcomes, and so we turned our research focus to studies on the social emotional needs and developmental needs of this age group, which is termed in most of this research young adolescents. So that's the term that sort of covers ages 10 to 15, which is about the broadest possible range you could consider when you're picturing middle school students. Um, we dug a little bit into John Hattie's research, he's a, a, a well-respected and recent educational researcher out of Australia. We looked at the um, American Middle Level Associ er, Association for Middle Level Education, excuse me, there are lots of acronyms. Um, that's a national association around middle level instruction. They sort of have a position paper that outlines some core tenets and beliefs that that group has established. So that's the, the body of research we looked into. Beyond that, we looked back at our own strategic plan survey from almost two years ago now. You'll recall that one of those questions was an open-ended question that asked specifically, we have 11 neighborhood elementary schools and two neighborhood middle schools, and what do you see as the strengths and challenges of that model? There were over 700 unique responses to that question and so I won't suggest that the council was able to digest those to the granular level but they certainly did read through and look for themes and patterns that emerged there. 
we talked about the configuration of public school districts in DuPage County and what we, we learned by just looking at how those districts are configured that we are one of two public school districts in DuPage County that currently has a 7-8 middle school configuration. The majority have 6-8, there are a handful with 5-8, there's one that has a 3-8 configuration, but right now we are one of two public school districts and that's whether it's a K-8 district or a unit district in DuPage County that's configured with a 7th and 8th grade middle school. We also spent some time talking about curriculum and where those learning standards are, are divided if they are and also what our resources look like from past adoptions into current adoptions and studies. And again, what that tells us is that essentially where there is a break in learning standards, it tends to split K-5, 6-8. So for example, in science and social studies, the, the learning standards describe very specific content in kindergarten, first, second, third, fourth, and fifth grade. And then when you reach grade six, there's a band of content standards for sixth through eighth that are intended to be met over that course of time. English language art standards don't have as definitive a line, but they are categorized K-5 and then 6-12. Math is a little more linear, health and art and music, there's, there's, there's different breaks, but again, the, the summary, and, and all of this is to be fair, a high level summary of a lot of conversation, is that where there is that delineation, it tends to break K-5, 6-8. Our own resources tend to do the same thing, though we haven't mandated that with resource adoption, most recently with English language arts and with science, and even as we look forward into the math resources that we're piloting, we have tended to find resources that we look at K through five and then six through eight with the possibility of finding a singular resource K8 to be sure, but the, 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 the delineation tends to be consistent there from the work of our curriculum committees as well. So what does that tell us? Where, you know, where does that leave us? The, the first thing that we recognized as a council is that the conclusions of the research are not gonna get us there. There is not conclusive research on the instructional model for this this specifically, to find a study that says what is the difference between a 6-8 middle school and a 7-8 middle school, that the, the research doesn't thread the needle quite that narrowly. But what the research does tell us consistently is a few things that come through in most of the studies. One is that transitions are a challenging time for students, and so wherever those transitions occur, there tends to be an academic slide or drop sometimes, and also there can tend to be some social and emotional challenges during transitional periods. It tells us that relationships are significant. The relationships that are built between students and the adults in their educational lives are, are important and, and a key indicator of their success. It also tells us that regardless of configuration, a strong curriculum, resources, the instructional strategies to back that up, and that social and emotional learning focus is a critical piece to student success measure in, in any outcome you would measure. So, much of that we probably didn't need all that research to tell us. It confirms things that we tend to know and believe to be true, but it was a, it, it, they were the themes that came through. It also made us realize that, as I said, research won't give us that definitive answer. It will inform our decisions, but ultimately we're going to have to decide what we value as a community and what we think is the right way to go. And so then we asked the council members individually to respond to two sort of culminating questions at the end of, of, of our last meetings. And the first question doesn't talk about design, but in general, what two or three things are most important to you in an instructional model for young adolescents, that age group that we're talking about? And I asked everyone to write those individually, actually on paper, we went low-tech, and so after reading through and compiling them, three major themes came through as a result of those responses. The first thing that was important is the idea of making big schools feel smaller. So we know that our students begin in a smaller elementary school and move to a larger middle school and move to a larger high school, typically, regardless of what that exact configuration is. And so the idea really was that we want to make sure that no student is, is getting lost as, as a system becomes larger or even regardless of what the size of that current system is. So that lends itself to thinking about social emotional supports, thinking about structures that ensure that students are, are shared among teachers and those teachers have a chance to not only build individual relationships, but to collaborate with each other to help, it, to help connect on student learning and also on student behavior and developmental needs. And keeping in mind that the students, the individual needs of those students will always be core to that sense of making sure that the, the school feels like it is designed for them as opposed to a large space that is generic. The second theme that came through is considering the needs of the whole young adolescent child. So again, that social emotional support, but really thinking about what the needs are of this age group and, and ensuring that we are using our knowledge and, and sharing our knowledge of those developmental needs to inform instructional practices. 
a lot of that starts, to, we, we had a lot of conversation around student choice and student voice and the evolution of that as students get older. Certainly that, that journey continues well beyond our K-8 system. And then finally, the third theme that emerged was that we want to have a clear vision for what we want to accomplish and then the structure and support to make it happen. So that true middle school model philosophy that allows for flexibility, not just in physical space, but in the instructional delivery model that we're able to provide and the way we can support students. Our current middle school schedule allows us many opportunities, but it also has some rigidity to it where we don't have a lot of flexibility in the way the day is constructed um, when we think about interventions and support. We also heard from the council members that they want to ensure that there is support for teachers, for parents, and if we were to make a transition, specifically support around that transition. And finally, that, that collaborative teaching model, the idea of teaming at the middle school that, that allows, again, for the sharing of students, but also for the creation of interdisciplinary opportunities where we can make natural and, and pretty seamless connections from what we might be learning about in science and what we're reading about in nonfiction texts in our English language arts classes. So we brought all of that together to just ask the question of the council. Do you believe that we should explore the feasibility of sixth to eighth grade middle schools? And that question was very deliberately worded because really our job at this point was to, to try to give some indication of is it from an instructional, pedagogical, developmental lens, is it even worth going down this road? Is this something that we can support from that vision before we even make some determinations around what that would look like? And so the, the answer was yes. I'll, it wasn't unanimous, but it was overwhelmingly yes. And, and the biggest reason cited from pretty much every respondent, even the one who may have said, I'm not sure about this yet, was that it creates more distance between those transitions. It gives us a chance to really in, enhance that middle school experience. There's a, there's a sense for, for many people that we spend the first half of seventh grade transitioning in, the last half of seventh grade transit, or excuse me, the last half of eighth grade transitioning out. And so there's not a lot of time in between to become really invested in our middle schools. There was a lot of conversation around the benefits, potentially for sixth graders in particular, the new opportunities they'd have, the, the depth of content exploration. Our sixth grade teachers do a phenomenal job of instruction of all content levels, just as our teachers in K through five do, but the difference between the way we're able to approach things like science and social studies instruction at the middle school because of configuration and some of the specialization could provide some additional content depth for those students. We talked about the curricular cohesion, where those six, eight standards tend to be together and what that will help the program look like. And again, the developmental needs can be well supported in this model. So yes, however, the council was also clear that it's not just a, a, a blanket yes. There are some things that we want to make sure we're considering if we do go down this road. And going out of order, I think the fourth bullet is, was the most um, telling. And the idea is that we, we aren't just moving sixth graders over to solve some problem and just by making the move, we would be able to endorse this from an instructional pedagogical standpoint. We need to really consider those teaming structures and the way we could share students. We need to make sure that what we're doing acknowledges that there are differences between an, a sixth grader at the beginning of the year and an eighth grader at the beginning of the year. And we want to have structures in place that allow us to support those differences. Those could be physical structures. Those could be timing structures. It could be class organization structures, but just making sure that we're considering those things. That true middle school philosophy, and, and again, maintaining the idea of we need to ensure that the work we're doing around curriculum and instruction and those collaboration opportunities for teachers continue to exist. So in the, the the broadest summary of the council's work was, from an instructional, developmental, pedagogical lens, there is good reason to pursue 6-8 middle schools, provided we are attending to these things that research and our own experiences and our, and our community's responses have told us are critical to the success of any middle school model. What's next for that council? Um, we'll have a chance to review that master facility plan as a group later on. And then again, as I, as I mentioned earlier, this group will head into much more work following um, all the next steps that are outlined. I, I imagine this will be a council we will hear from over the, the life of the strategic plan as the, the work ahead is, is significant. But it's a, it's a really, it's a great group of teachers and parents and administrators who have been willing to have robust and frank conversations and have been eager to participate in the process. So with that, I'll ask if there are any questions. I have one question. Sure. Um, you talked about the, the concept of teaming mm -hmm. and how, as part of the, the council, kind of it seemed like that was something that they were supportive of. And I've heard anecdotally from several teachers that it's definitely something that they would like to see considered as we move into this, this next phase. Um, when you were researching and 
you know, you, you talked about all the different studies and, and books and things that you looked at. Was there support for the concept of teaming within the research as well in terms of providing the best middle school experience for students? Was that like a, a, a focus of, of the experience through the research? Generally speaking, I would say yes. Whether it's called teaming, it, it's it's really it's the it's the components of that team structure that are that are cited in most of the resource so research. Excuse me. So that's going to include again that that sharing of students, so that mm -hmm. while there may be a number of, of you know there may be three hundred students in a grade level or four hundred, a, a smaller group of one hundred or one hundred and fifty have the same English language arts teacher, the same math teacher, so that those teachers can connect more naturally on student progress and student behaviors and things like that. And it also speaks to the interdisciplinary unit and the ability for those teachers that are on a shared team to have that time to collaborate together to accomplish all those things. So it may not always have the word teaming associated. That word can vary a little bit, but the concept of teaming, absolutely, I would, I would say yes, is well supported by research. Thank you. Justin, of the staff and, and parents who are on the committee who weren't completely sold on the idea of exploring the feasibility of 6-8 middle schools, well, how would you summarize their reservations? Hmm. Um, I think that, and, and, and really to be sure, when we asked the question, what, the yes or no question, it was, it was truly one respondent that said I'm not sure and one that said yes with, so, with, a, with a little hesitation. And I think both of those people um, started the process honestly saying they, they were coming in as fans of our current system because they've seen it work really well. And I think that's, and, and I, I think, you know, further down the, the responses of those people, I think it was, if we can really accomplish some of these things, then I, I could start to get even more excited about it. So I think that the hesitation, you know, honestly comes from, we've had this system in place for a very long time, and there are people who have only had this experience mm -hmm. as teachers, or even perhaps as students, or as parents, and so that's where, you know, that's where some of that hesitation, there were as many people who came in and said, I wasn't sure where I fell on this, but having talked through it and really listened through it, I think it could be exciting. I mean, there were people who thought that we were considering this, and we were just going to try to cram 300 more students into one of our schools, and when they realized that wasn't the case, they got more interested in it. Do you know what I mean? So it, I think, and I, and I should bring that up to, sh to say, it's really about building background. The feedback that we've gotten from people who have been anywhere less than on the, the firmly, you know, four or five on a positive Likert scale, tends to ask for more information. I would like to learn more about it. I'd like to hear more about it. I'd like for myself to be able to dig into this research so that I can feel as well informed as the rest of the council and things like that. So I think that's where the hesitation lands. Mm -hmm. So I guess a mental note for myself going forward is just as we move down this path, um, continuously be as a board and as, as, as a leadership team, just can be continuously listening to um, those in the community um, who may be a minority, um, but just um, understanding if anybody is opposed to the model. I just want to know, I've got a better sense of why. Um, certainly it's, um, there is that bias, I think, I'll just, my, my own bias, I came from a 6 eight junior high, so I mean, that's, that's something I'm, I was, I can't remember who I was talking to before the meeting, um, somebody, and I just said, oh, or I think it was John's wife, oh, my daughter's going into sixth grade, um, and, uh, oh, um, so I was thinking middle school, no, she'd see, of course not, but I, I, I sometimes get to mix it up, so anyway, my point is just thinking about um, where our community is, because that's um, a pretty big decision that they need to make, and if I, I've, you know, you heard some rumblings already, I just want to make sure we have a good sense of where the community is by having our finger on their pulse. Um, the other point, just as another, just me throwing in my two cents, I like what you said about the ideas of creating, um, I don't know how you phrase it, but you, you mentioned physical um, structures to, uh, to support transitioning students. And so I'm, I'm a big fan of, of pods or schools within a school and the, the true sense of middle school model. If, if there are people who have that reservation about, oh, my sixth grader being in the same building as the seventh and eighth graders, that those, the way that we could be creative in how we design additions to the buildings <coughs> could put a lot of those parents at ease when they are thinking about sending their kids to middle school a year earlier than they thought they would. Thanks. Well, thank you uh, for your presentation today. Uh, you know, there's a lot of thoughtfulness that, that really went on in the, <clears throat> in the dialogue. And I gotta tell you, the, the concerns I think I hear from most people are either that we're gonna plop sixth grade into that building and, and treat them like we always had, or that we're gonna just plop them in there and treat them like eighth graders. And uh, so to hear the thoughtfulness in the process of, if you do that, it's because we're actually changing our model in, in which the way we educate. 
and that sixth grade won't look like seventh grade. Seventh grade doesn't necessarily look like eighth grade, but it's sort of a transition model in, in getting them ready for, for high school. Um, I didn't really think about before, but I, I think that was a very valid point that was addressed in that transition. We do have two transitions that are, are very quick, right? Coming into seventh grade and, and going out into your freshman year um, over at, at North or South. So uh, thank you uh, for that, and um, it was very educational, so I appreciate it. Thanks. Right. Listed on tonight's agenda are 13 communications received by the board. Are there any additional communications board members would like to share at this time? Okay. So we're going to move on to the reports to the board, and we'll start with the superintendent's report. Thank you. I have uh, several things to update the board and our community on. First of all, uh, we have been uh, very busy planning for the upcoming school year. On tonight's agenda, under the personal consent agenda, you will uh, see that our teams have um, been hiring and in some cases rehiring teachers and other staff in preparation for the upcoming school year. We have a few key positions for which we are still working on interviewing and hiring, but we believe we are well on our way to being fully staffed in August with exceptional candidates for each and every position. Um, in addition to reviewing and planning for our staffing needs, we've also continued to review and reflect upon our budget. The board will receive a recap of the fiscal year 2019 um, at the July board meeting along with updates to uh, the fiscal year 2020 budget at that time, followed by the budget workshop, which is planned for August 26th. Um, again, uh, we continue to anticipate a balanced, balanced budget for this upcoming school year and continue to work really hard to make sure that that is the reality. Uh, the final board approval for the fiscal year 2020 budget is anticipated at the board's regular meeting in September. Um, with regards to enrollment, we have received submitted registration from 88% of our expected returning students. There's about 1% who have started registration but haven't yet submitted. Um, there's about 9% of students who have not yet started registration. And we only have about 2.5% of our students who are expected not to return next year are moving or otherwise from our district. So that's a, a really good percentage. And thanks to everyone for responding so we can get our hiring done. Um, typically in June or July we are reviewing student assessment results from our spring assessments because this evening's meeting was rescheduled and slightly earlier than our typical June meeting to accommodate the promotion ceremony for eighth grade. Um, we are planning for a detailed review of spring student assessments at the July board meeting. I mentioned that sooner so at that time Justin will be reviewing uh, with the board and our community the results from the spring NWEA map achievement results and growth as well as the Ames web assessments. Um, this year's Illinois assessment of readiness results will not be available as is typically uh, the case until um, early fall, but we are eager to review and celebrate the growth of our students uh, there as well. Um, I mentioned curriculum work a little earlier when we were talking about the strategic plan. Um, we, ha we are really well positioned for this summer. We have um, our science STEM resources adopted. Our teachers have received some training there already. For math, those uh, teachers who are on the math committee and some of their partners who will be piloting for the upcoming school year, um, we are poised to have their training completed before the end of this school year. So there's already been one day. There's another day happening uh, later this week, tomorrow. Um, so those teachers will have that training ahead of summer, which is really, really nice so that they can um, spend some time, if they wish, over the summer kind of digging into those materials and be well positioned to support success of our students uh, at the beginning of the school year. Um, Otherwise, in terms of curriculum, this summer we'll be going through the usual processes for um, resources over the summer, um, ordering, distributing, making sure teachers have what they need before the start of the school year. And as a side note, we're really proud to report that we have identified a new process for donation of some of our older resources. So with the new adoption of ELA and writing resources with the new adoption of science STEM resources. We have some older textbooks that won't be in use anymore. Um, we have found a new organization uh, to which we can donate our old textbooks and they will be used for underprivileged students in other countries through the organization called Books for a Cause. So we're really excited about that. Those, those resources will be put to good use uh, by other students. 
Um, in terms of some summer projects, typically we have some facility projects happening over the summer. Um, our summer facility projects this summer are relatively light, largely because we are uh, really focused on our master facility planning efforts, and so we're not taking on any really big projects this summer. Uh, but we will see um, continued maintenance projects, um, some of those smaller projects. We do painting over the summer, mulching, some grounds work, and a deep cleaning throughout all of our schools in preparation for the upcoming school year. So that will continue to occur. Um, we mentioned the facility planning efforts and uh, that, that work will be coming back to the board in July with some more discussion and it's at that time that the board will really want to review the timeline um, and kind of some of those next steps as well as as we've talked about some of that community engagement effort it really from this point forward we feel like we've done a lot of community engagement thus far but um, in earnest we need to continue to do that um, in order to build a plan that is really reflective of uh, what our teachers and our community our parents uh, want to see within our schools so I would encourage the the board to to really focus in on that in July um, summer school we're in great shape we are really excited for eighth grade promotion that will happen on Monday Thank you for accommodating the rescheduling of this meeting to allow for that um, to happen Monday evening. O'Neill will go first at 5 and Herrick at 7, and that's always a wonderful celebration of our students as well as um, our teachers' hard work with our students. So with that, I conclude my superintendent's report, and I appreciate um, everything that was um, said this evening. It was very kind and generous, so thank you. Then on to the monthly business report with Todd Rayfall. I apologize in advance for the number of action items coming out <laughs> of the business office for the meeting. Um, it's that time of year of year end and year beginning, uh, bids and so forth and work uh, for the next fiscal year and some closeout uh, items for the end of this fiscal year. And I just wanted to go through a few things uh, on those. Uh, first off, we do not have, we posted this afternoon, the year to date and treasures report because we had uh, finally just balanced them because of the change in the date. Um, reconciling takes some time. Uh, we won't review it completely, uh, but know that uh, because of both property tax and a unanticipated early state uh, distribution of, of funds, uh, we have uh, funds on hand uh, to pay bills for the remainder of the, of the fiscal year. Uh, that was something we've talked about as a concern uh, in previous months and wanted to make you aware of that. Uh, we can review both the June end and July uh, year-to-date reports at the July board meeting. But you have that information in your packets now and it's posted online. And regarding uh, some of the other items, some of the more call them unusual of sorts, uh, there are some fund transfer items that the board uh, does on an annual basis. Uh, one is um, a transfer of interest from the working cash fund um, to the sinking fund. Sinking fund is a sub fund of the operations and maintenance fund used um, to build up for capital uh, needs. And um, it has been tradition that we do a transfer. We're tra transferring half of the interest. Uh, it was a good year on the interest income piece. So that is our recommendation there. As well as a transfer of, from the education fund to the debt service fund. Under state code, it is required that all debt be paid out of the debt service fund or fund 30. Most of that is bonded debt that the district has issued bonds for uh, for capital items. Copier leases that are capital or other capital type items also should be paid out, must be paid out of that fund. And that revenue source is in the ed fund. So once a year we have to do a transfer of the uh, amount of money that is that expense to to that fund and so that is that transfer um, action item for the board to do one um, one big item I said in, in the sense of, of overall cost and work um, the health and wellness committee has a recommendation to the board this evening for um, several prong format one uh, to adjust rates starting July 1st the new fiscal year uh, to 9.9 percent for three of the four health insurance plans that the district offers uh, as well as a, an understanding and, and the committee has actually structured meetings to meet through the summer to continually review claims um, to realign and adjust our 
premium adjustments to open enrollment time. So when uh, employees actually have an opportunity to choose between funds, now that we have multiple plans, they can pick uh, during that time, and that time is in the fall, and it takes effect in January. So this 9.9 .9 is an initial piece, and uh, the committee will continue to work and look at and come to the board uh, by its October meeting with uh, an additional information um, for to, to establish rates that then take effect from January 1st, 2020 through to the following December. Um, and so they will continue to work on that as well as a wellness initiative uh, to establish that. Um, those who may recall in April we did a, a spotlight on the wellness health and wellness committee and some of its work that is done for the last year and one thing we had said was you know next year was about wellness and so uh, one ways of trying to control insurance costs is to try not to use them and there are several ways to go about that one of them is important is to uh, to work on on a wellness piece and a long-term piece so that is our initial part is to offer up an incentive for doing a screening um, and we are funding some of that um, funding that that piece from funds uh, as we've illustrated in the, in the memo uh, f moving them from our um, flex spending account that is has had an accumulation of surplus in that fund and using that and transferring that to the to the reserve fund for those purposes and so that allows us to start that piece and then the committee will work forward after it gets data in, uh, summary data and start working for the year to come up with different uh, initiatives and, and systems to to uh, improve wellness. And I think there's gonna be some other recommendations coming uh, in the near future as well. So those are the main pieces I think I wanted to cover um, of the action items and, um, and report. So unless there are questions. Uh, do you mind just speaking to how, how we accumulate money in a flexible spending account? Flexible spending account is a um, it's account that employees, uh, you can contribute, you, you put into, and um, you then can take it out and use that for your medical costs. So your co-pays and your prescriptions and so forth. Um, you have a calendar year uh, to use those funds. If you don't use all those funds, then you know you, you can't get them back, um, and we can't refund them. Uh, it's an IRS code structure, um, and so that is that's what's in that fund. And you always want to have a surplus, particularly for a school district. For example, if someone starts a, a flex spending fund, which you do in January, and you set your new uh, establishment of what you're going to contribute. If I say I'm going to put $2,000 into that fund, I'm going to pay for that in 26 pays from January 1st through December 31st. If I leave in June and I have used all $2,000 of that fund, but I've only paid in 1000 obviously the fund's at risk for that $1,000. Um, however, if I go through December and don't use all of that, then, um, then that money is left over. Um, we looked at that in January and realized we had a surplus and there's some run out time frames for the IRS for people to have uh, some expenses that come due and that comes into March and realized that, you know, in essence, we have a large, a large balance that we don't need to have that type of surplus. So the question is, how do we use that? Um, and it is a one-time transfer, so, you know, and we aren't transferring everything. Uh, we're transferring what's a comfortable conservative number uh, so that we still have cushion in that fund, um, but then using that to help fund that wellness incentive. Because one of that one of those incentive pieces uh, is that if you go through the screening, um, and it's for an employee and a spouse who are covered in the district's insurance plans, a uh, hundred dollar gift card or you know debit card, and uh, to incentive people who might not normally do that. Um, so in a way, it's, it's helping and giving back to employees in that format. So that's how, we're, that's how that fund works, and that's how we're, we're looking to, to use that one-time transfer. Thanks. Any other questions? All right, thank you. Thank you.
Move on to our committee reports. We'll start off with the policy committee, which met on May 21st of 2019 uh, with Member Samante. Mm, thank you. Um, we met on the 21st, and uh, per the notes, we are um, putting two policies um, having to do with student health um, up for first reading um, tonight. Um, and then holding back on two, again, the community relations citizens communications to the board and internal board operations uh, determining agenda um, the committee decided to um, take some time um, over the summer wait till dr. Russell was here um, and wait until the school starts again um, to look into those um, the other thing that we talked about um, moving forward is um, just the difference between what a policy um, that the board has plus administrative regulations. So within the policies, if um, there is a board regula or um, an administration regulation that it refers to, we're going to bury that into the policy so that people can click on it or refer to things right there um, instead of having to search for information that they might not understand. All right, then with that, is there a motion to approve for first reading policies 5100.2, health, eye, and dental examinations, and 5100.3, students with chronic infectious diseases, and place them on the July board agenda for final approval? So moved. Second. <coughs> uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried to approve for first reading policies 5100.2 and 5100.3 and place them on the July board agenda for final approval. Next up is the legislative committee, which did not meet since the last board meeting, and neither did FAC. So uh, we have district leadership team, which did meet on May 21st, 2019. Um, and because of what our first spotlight on the schools were, uh, we don't really have, I don't really have much to add to that except to just point out the incredible amount of work and conversation that's been going on amongst uh, all the subcommittees and councils that have been created and also just the wonderful dialogue I think that we had in the in the last DLT meeting um, the real creative ways in in which we're discussing how we better communicate um, with the community I think is really important especially because that communication is going to be really important even when it comes to to our um, rigor component and, and, and educational piece and especially all the stuff that we're doing uh, with facilities. So I really just want to take the opportunity to thank everybody that's on the DLT and um, keep up the good work. I don't know if you have anything else to add. I was officially the first meeting that I sat on as a board member, not as a parent. So I guess that would be the only thing. There's that open spot if we were to fill that. Yeah, definitely. I think here in July here we need to, we're going to take a, a look at all of our committees to make sure because because what happens over time is we start seeing yep. slowly some people just start to not, not show up anymore. So it'll be a good opportunity in July to sort of send out some blanket emails and then figure out where we're missing uh, people. Well, and, and simply to add to that, I think most people when they agree to a board committee or a council are thinking they're agreeing for one year. So um, it's been our practice in July or August to um, reinitiate that, make mm -hmm. sure people who wish to stay on the council uh, or the committee, whichever it is, um, have that invitation to do so. But also that people are recognized and allowed to maybe volunteer for something different and excuse themselves from that service and then we extend that invitation out to other community members or teachers or administrators to join so um, just to put it on the new board's radar that that is a really good practice to follow in August perfect mm -hmm. any questions <coughs> okay well we have no uh, discussion items on our agenda this month so that brings us to the uh, reception of visitors. This is an opportunity for members of the audience to share public comment with the board, but is not intended to be a time for members of the public to enter into a dialogue with the board. Issues raised during public comment may be added to future agendas or addressed by administrative staff as appropriate. Criticisms of individuals is not in order. The board has allocated 30 minutes for public comment this evening. We encourage you to keep your comments to a, to a three minute limit and to allow, so that we can allow everyone to speak. At this time, have we received any cards? No cards? All right, so then we will just ask if anybody's interested in speaking to stand up, uh, approach the podium, and state your name and your attendance area.
Hello. John Miller, Whittier Attendance Area. And I, I guess Herrick, everybody always says the grade school and they forget about, we're just talking about <laughs> middle school curriculum here and everybody should say two schools when they get up here. But anyway, um, this, this I was just looking at a couple of agenda items and, and first off, thanks uh, uh, Justin, that, that, that is great information. And I've been hearing about this stuff in the community. People are talking about it. I was at a softball game last night and people were like, have you heard about possibly doing this or that? And what I've encouraged people to do is, is attend some meetings to fully understand what it is. And I know you're talking about the curriculum part now, but they're, they're like, well, what do you do with the kids? Where do they go? What do you do with the buildings? And uh, you know, just let them know that's coming. I'm, you know, obviously that's, that's coming, because a lot of them had the same thing. How are you gonna put 300 more kids in schools that are already crowded? Um, so it, that, was, that was a good presentation. What I'd like to, there's two items on the agenda. One's the prevailing wage, and I say this every year. That is just a mandate from the state to pay 10 to 40 percent more for labor on construction projects. Um, and why you all have to vote on it, I don't know, because there's nothing in the provision that says what happens if you vote no. So in my time, the 10 times I got to vote for it, I'd voted no, because I wanted to see what happened if the, if the board just voted no. So I would encourage at least four of you tonight to vote no and see, see what happens and, and maybe challenge the state a little bit, because it, you know, it's bad enough all the mandates they throw on you. And if they want the prevailing wage, they give you what it is, why do you have to vote on it? It's just another one of those things the state's reaching into what they say is local control and taking it away. And I'm not just talking union wages. I built a building in this county for $50 million and my invoice for union labor was 20% lower than for the union labor on uh, the Lester edition. That's, that's ridiculous. And you have to pay it, you have to do it. But it's nothing to do with the market. And I would encourage four of you to vote no and just see what the state says when you tell them back. You say no. And then the other one, I don't know why we have to buy mulch, because it, it appears the state is to overtaking our playground. So why don't we send the bill to the state and have our representative um, pay for the mulch? I mean, I don't think the community understands that the district spent a lot of work and a lot of time and staff effort putting together a list of what they thought were the, the priorities for the district only for our state representative to go on a Facebook blog and find out a few parents wanted playgrounds, so we get playgrounds. But yeah, who cares if the roof leak or the electrical systems are failing or the plumbing doesn't work? Uh, we'll have nice playgrounds. And so that's my two cents. Thank, Thank you. you, John. Scott. Is that under three minutes? <laughs> 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 It was two minutes and 28 seconds. Well done. Well done. Congratulations. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay. That'll end our, our opportunity for public comment. Uh, anyone need a recess? We good? All right. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. First thing up is the approval of minutes. Are there any suggested revisions to the minutes that are presented today in the packet of materials? If not, is there a motion to approve the minutes from May 13th, 2019, meeting as presented? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried to approve the mi minutes from the May 13th, 2019 meeting as presented. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the May 14th, 2019 board tour and El Sierra PTA meeting as presented? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried to approve the minutes for the May 14th, 2019 board tour and El Sierra PTA meeting as presented. Next up on the agenda is the approval of the consent agenda. Are there any items a board member would like to have to considered separately? And if not, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda consisting of the personnel report and financial statements consisting of the list of bills as presented in the packet of materials? So moved. Second. Melissa, please call roll. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. And Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried. The consent agenda has been approved as presented in the packet of materials. Thank you, and I would, uh, it would be my pleasure to introduce uh, Rosanna Kirjaki, 
Um, thank you. She will be our new, you just approved her as our new EL coordinator and teacher, and we're thrilled to have you joining our team. Our, our teams were really impressed by your vision and your service to kids, and, and we can't wait to have you serving our schools. So thank you. Next up is the approval of the Consolidated District Plan recommended by Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum and Instruction and Assistant Superintendent for Special Services. Is there a motion to approve the 2019-2020 District 58 Consolidated District Plan application to the State uh, Illinois State Board of Education? So moved. Second. All right, I think to kick off the discussion, uh, Justin has a small presentation. Thanks, and I, I hope it will be. I will try to be brief with this, but the Consolidated District Plan is something new for all school districts this year. Essentially what this is is a document that allows us to answer a set of questions that are actually required for all of the grants you see on the screen, but this, the state's allowing us to answer them in, in one fell swoop to, to do the assurances for all of it. So this replaces most closely the Title I District Plan that we had approved uh, last fall. It's, it's not new, it's not new questions, but it's a new process. And since the entire application is 33 pages and about four point font, I thought some highlighting would be appropriate <laughs> for everybody. Um, so the application essentially in includes our accountability and compliance pieces for all of the, the state and federal grant processes. So assuring that we're using the funds equitably, talking about how we identify needs, making sure a big component is that we're consulting with stakeholders as we develop the plans for the use of grant funds. And that includes both our, our District 58 stakeholders as well as our non-public schools nearby. Um, again, and then we assure the quality of our educational programming and all of the other requirements of grants that, um, that again, apply to all of those pieces. We also have to give a general indication of how we intend to use the funds. This isn't where we get budget level specific, but just how do we assess the needs that each grant fund can support, and then how do we support those needs. And then again, because Title I has some specific requirements, those are still included here. And because of that, I just wanted to keep that overview of what Title I actually is. The full definition is, is here taken right from the ISB documentation, but essentially Title I funding is intended to provide additional funds to schools who have a large percentage of families who come from low income or who experience lower incomes. It also supports uh, homeless students or students who are identified as homeless through McKinney-Vento um, through supplies and fees and transportation. And so the school qualifies as a Title I school based on the school population and the percentage of, of families within that school who are identified as, as eligible for free and reduced lunch, which is the criteria we use. That There are four elementary schools that we service with Title I funds, El Sierra, Henry Puffer, Indian Trail, and Kingsley. So that's how a school becomes eligible. Then that difference is what, how do we determine which students receive support from the, from the Title I funding, and those two, those two things live in separate silos. So once a school is eligible to receive Title I funding based on the low income percentage, then the students from within that school, regardless of their, of their family's income situation, are assessed just as all students are in reading and math achievement. And when students demonstrate at-risk performance or, or achievement below certain levels, then they're identified for additional support and collaboration between their classroom teacher, their principal, and often our reading specialist or our new interventionist. So just to clarify, as we do every year at this time, it, the Title I funding comes through the, the free and reduced lunch percentage. The Title I services are based on need. The other grants included in the Consolidated District Plan are, are Title II and Title IV is sort of an extension of, of, of Title II in a, in a general sense. We combine those as a district. Uh, Title II is really about teacher quality and improving the quality of our, of our instructional staff all the way from administration through teachers. And so we primarily use this for, for, for professional development activities. A lot of it pays for substitute costs as we are able to do a lot of those things in district. We've also begun to access some conferences and things like that for staff. Um, that portion of our grant dollars is also one of the, the portions that is accessed by our non-public schools, so they're able to provide professional development for their staff based on a, a percentage formula of funding that they receive. Title III focuses on our language instruction education program, so again, we're focusing on professional development as well as some direct instructional services, um, right now primarily through the use of paraprofessionals in our English learner and biliteracy programs. Our IDEA grant is the special education grant, and the only reason I'm speaking to it is because it's a high-level overview. That's the work that Jessica Stewart does in great detail, but um, 
that includes, again, similar types of services that happen through that funding, professional development, as well as direct services, and, and instructional materials can also come through grants. And IDEA obviously reaches our K-8 program, but also there's a specific portion of IDEA that, that fun, funnels directly to our preschool. The use of the funds, as I've mentioned, our primary uses are professional development, um, instruction materials, and specifically some intervention support materials for students who are, who are eligible in buildings or through these programs. And then again, um, historically, we've consistently funded instructional assistant or paraprofessional positions through the grant funds. More recently, due to some changes in, in the requirements around grant um, reimbursements, we are now looking into funding some more certified staff positions. And so in the coming year, we'll be continuing to fund those which were new this year, our Title I interventionists um, at, the, at the elementary schools. And also we're looking at um, at least partial funding of, of a social work position through IDEA. Where this goes from here, hopefully you approve the plan in just a couple of moments, and then I hit submit, and it goes to the Illinois State Board of Education, and then they vet it, and, and usually send it back three or four times for changes, and then eventually approve it. Um, and then that allows us access to the individual grants, so each one of those then has its own application process, which the State Board will approve, and all of that leads us to be able to begin um, requesting reimbursement for activities that fall under grant funding as of August. That's the end of the presentation, so I can take any questions, and you can take any questions. No questions? Thank you. I know that's a, a lot of work to put that together, so we appreciate it. All right, any more discussion? <coughs> then, uh, Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried to approve the 2019-2020 District 58 Consolidated District Plan application to the Illinois State Board of Education. Now up is the resolution of nomination for membership on the Downers Grove Plan Commission. Is there a motion to adopt the resolution of nomination for membership on the Downers Grove Plan Commission naming Steve Olchek as representative to the Plan Commission for the 2019-2020 year? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Thanks, Steve. Thank you. <laughs> Melissa, well, you know, I, I, I had to fight you guys off for that one. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was, I actually attended the, the meeting on Monday, so it's actually something that I am interested in. So I'd, I'd be more than honored to represent the district in, in that capacity. And I actually realized that somebody is on the, the commission that I've crossed paths in a, a previous life. So it's, uh, it, was, it was fun to attend that, and I look forward to attending those monthly meetings moving forward. Thank you. Melissa, please call roll. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried to adopt the resolution of nomination for membership on the Downers Grove Plan Commission naming Steve Olchek as representative to the Plan Commission for 2019-2020. All right. Now we have a recommendation from the Health and Wellness Committee to approve medical insurance rates and wellness incentive program. Is there a motion to approve, one, the premium increase for the two PPO plans and the high deductible plan with HSA by 9.9% effective July 1, as noted in the attached memo, and two, the contract with CHC Wellbeing, Inc. to initiate an employee wellness incentive program? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Yeah, um, one thing I just want to throw in there, Darren, is um, I've been I have been contacted over the past month by a number of, of fellow board members who I can see are, are yearning for some more information on, from the Health and Wellness Committee. Um, and as my capacity as liaison, one thing I, I intend to do is work with Todd to keep the board regularly appraised of, of the businesses of that committee over, the, over the, the, my, my term on that, in that position as a liaison. Um, it's, you know, it's such a, it's, it's one of the hardest things that, that I've had to address as a board member, and I'm sure you might feel the same, is, is insurance. I mean, it, it's, it's so hard to, to tackle because, one, it's, it's political. Um, two, it's, 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 it's emotional. It, it's, it's intimate, your, 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 your health, your well-being. And, um, and then three, it's, it's super complicated. So there's a lot of people who, um, who are, are seeing changes to their plans, and they don't understand it. And it's, it's something that's really hard to understand, but also really, under, really difficult to, to explain it. So um, I think that we would all benefit as a board from, with some more information on, on, on how our plans work, 
how money comes in, where it goes. You know, we have four different plans. What does that mean? How is each one performing? Um, you know, it's one thing that you know we all we want we want to provide competitive, great benefits for for our staff, but we also at the same time understand that um, we can't. You know, like the, the, our costs are going up, and it's really difficult to to to, um, to have a, a future where we are where our costs are going up so much that we can't afford to to retain teachers or to um, put supplies into kids' hands. So we want to be just responsible stewards of of um, the community's investment in our schools, while while making sure that our, our employees are, are well taken care of. And just uh, so I just want to be able to have that conversation with the board um, on an ongoing basis, so that um, they're well aware of the really really super important work that goes on there. Uh, thank you, Greg. And um, um, I, I've, we've talked about it in the past, but uh, this starting in, in August, I'd like to add the Health and Wellness Committee to our our committee reports. Uh, I think that is going to be important, especially as, as uh, in October we're going to be coming up with another one of these recommendations. And I think that that looking at the individual plans and how they're performing and what those costs are, money in, money out, is going to be really important in uh, just being very clear and transparent with the, the community and, and, the, and the staff in, in understanding how that spending goes. So I, I think that is important and I'm looking forward to adding that uh, under our agenda starting in August. Any other discussion? And, and for the other board members, I, I think Todd phrased it nicely, but this is a, a weird year because we don't, we typically only set our premiums once a year, but because of the desire to align um, premium increases with open enrollment, so, so staff may make an informed decision. Um, when their premiums that go up, they can also look at the plans and see which is the best for them and for their families. Um, it's, we, this is, we're going to have this, be having the same conversation again in three or four months. So just what, again, just want to make sure that everybody is really well aware of, of how this works and, and what this means for, for us as a board. Do, are, you, are you suggesting so between now and August we would be able to see all the different and how, how it all breaks down, the different plans? Well, I think starting in August, we'll, we'll start taking a look at, at some of those numbers and, and what each plan has. And what, so that as we approach October, when we have to set a new rate, we have, I think, we all have better visibility on, on how the, the plans are performing individually. Thank you. Yeah. I think it's, uh, I'll just second or third or fourth the interest in seeing at that level. Uh, if you look at our budget, we are an educator first, but we're probably a self, we're an insurer second mm -hmm. um, as our business model. Um, and that uh, amount that we've spent talking about insurance is uh, not uh, at the level of like being an insurer. Uh, and I think we can get better here and get more transparent here. Um, not that there's anything that's happening that, that doesn't seem uh, on the up and up, but just an education of how this works. Um, none of us got into this business because we wanted to be an insurance company, but it is a significant line item on our budget, and at the end of the day, we have a certain amount of dollars that we can distribute to uh, to all the things that we want to do as a school district. Um, and so I appreciate the transparency and the push for it. Um, I'm excited to hear more as much as I'm sure Todd doesn't want to speak to it as much as we're going to be asking him to. I think it's going to be helpful for us and for those listening, those out in the audience, to hear about that, uh, about the transparency. Yeah, and we'll that's be where it's helpful that we have we have Greg as our liaison on that health and wellness committee, and um, is is they're beginning to um, ramp up their meetings and get more. You're moving to a monthly cycle, right? Isn't that the case? So uh, that'll help us keep keep way more informed than we than we've been in the past. So. Thanks, Okay, then uh, Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Samanti? Aye. Member Weiner? Aye. Member Doshi? Aye. Member Hannes? Aye. Member Harris? Aye. Member Olchik? Aye. Member Hughes? Aye. Motion carried to approve one, the premium increase for two PPO plans and the high deductible plan with HSA by 9.9% effective July 1, 2019, as noted in the attached memo. And two, the contract with CHC Wellbeing Inc. to initiate an employee wellness incentive program. Next up is the property casual liability and workers' <coughs> compensation insurance recommended by the business office. Is there a motion to approve the purchase of property casualty liability and workers' compensation insurance coverage for the period of July 1, 2019 through June 30th, 2020 at the rates in the attached memo? So moved. Second. Second. Member Hannes? 
Second. Any discussion? Melissa, if you please go roll. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried to approve the purchase of property, casualty, liability, and workers' compensation insurance for the period of July 1, 2019 through June 30, 2020 at the rates in the attached memo. Next step is stop loss insurance recommended by the business office. Is there a motion to accept the proposal from Aetna for a specific stop loss insurance coverage at an estimated cost of $854,122 for the plan year of July 1, 2019 through June 20th, 2020? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Just want to make sure. So this uh, amount has gone up by, it seems, about $220,000 from last year? Yep. And that's just because we're using, we have more claims than we, Yep. than what, they're not gonna keep their premiums lower than what they're paying out. Correct, they had a premium of 600,000, they paid 1.3 million, okay. so far today. Did we price this out with anyone else? Uh, yes, we, um, our, our consultant puts it out for bid and this was the most competitive format. Uh, we do have a lot of, you know, that, that passed on it, and there are others that, you know, were well above or wanted stipulations in there that would drive the cost and put our risk at a much higher level. So. Now, this may be a strange question, but is there any um, reason why we would want to move this to the calendar year to align with the way we set rates? Um, we'll look, it's something we will look at as we go to you know into that piece, the problem is you reset your stop loss. So if you've hit, gone into it um, in six months, you restart at zero, um, and so it's it's a it's a careful piece. It is something that we'll probably have to leave in this fixed fiscal year, and depending you know, if we have a better year, um, we will look at that as to when it's most advantageous to switch it to sync up with everything else. Perfect. Any other questions? Right. And uh, Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried to accept the proposal from Aetna for specific stop loss insurance coverage at an estimated cost of $854,122 for the plan year of July 1, 2019 through June 20th. Uh, is it supposed to be June 30th? Yes, it is. June 30th, 2020. <clears throat> All right. Uh, resolution now appointing a school treasurer recommended by the business office. Is there a motion to adopt the resolution appointing school treasurer as presented? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All right. Melissa, please call roll. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried to adopt the resolution appointing school treasurer as presented. Uh, we have uh, another recommendation from the business office of a resolution approving a surety bond of the treasurer. Is there a motion to adopt the resolution approving surety bond of treasurer as presented in an annual premium of $12,409 and a limit and penalty of $23,040,030? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Does somebody just mind explaining what this means? Uh, it is required um, in the state of Illinois that every school treasurer have a bond uh, equal to a 25% of the cash available uh, at any given time um, so that if said treasurer was to run off, there would be payment from the bond company. Um, so it, it is a legal requirement and the state can stop sending money to the school district if this isn't in, in place, so it has to be in place by the end of June. It's an annual piece that we have to, and, and, and our uh, property casualty uh, insurance uh, company goes out and receives bids for this uh, annually to see who, you know, 
what, what they come back with. So and it's currently with Broker's Risk, underwritten by Lloyd's. Any questions? All right, Melissa, please, please call roll. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Simanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. And Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried to adopt a resolution approving surety bond of treasurer as presented at an annual premium of $12,409 and a limit slash penalty of $23,040,030. Next up is a resolution authorizing accounting transfer to debt service fund to implement state regulations recommended by the business office. Is there a motion to adopt the resolution authorizing accounting transfer to debt service fund to implement state regulations in the amount of $69,784? So Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Simanti. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried to adopt the resolution authorizing accounting transfer to debt service fund to implement state regulations in the amount of $69,784. We have a resolution to transfer interest income to the sinking fund as recommended by the business office. Is there a motion to adopt the resolution transferring interest earned to sinking fund in the amount of $56,769? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Has there been a talk about how we might increase amount, the amount of investment earnings we have, or is there an opportunity to? We did that? have, uh, yeah, we had that at the last FAC meeting uh, to talk about some opportunities, and, and at the next one we're going to schedule another vendor to talk about you know ways we can we can do that. So yes. Is there a low hanging fruit with limited risk, or would everything require more risk? Uh, what we are looking to, we always look to you know increase the time that that investment is out. So obviously that you know locks in a little higher rate. Um, but at this point, we would look at likely having to take on some more risk. Now we have our structure is almost a zero risk format. We have insured CDs, um, so we are at you know the lowest level. Um, there are other opportunities looking at that use securitization of overall funds that are municipal you know investments um, but those are some of the opportunities and that's what the next we we'll get that scheduled with the FAC meeting uh, to go through that with them um, and, and see what their thoughts are what the recommendation might be coming from that committee great thanks mm -hmm. anything else Right. And Todd, maybe you could just talk about the, the dollar value that we're we're kind of trying to pursue, like in, in going after those investment opportunities. I know you kind of had a ballpark number that if we kind of <laughs> went with them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, we we our interest increased substantially this year from prior years, uh, but in large part due to interest rate increases that have happened in the last twelve months have substantially increased. So. Um, I'm trying to remember, that was a couple months ago now. I don't remember. No, I, I thought you had a topic. I, I, didn't, I mean, I didn't have a real number, but just we know that there's some opportunities out there uh, to do some different things, um, you know, to help increase some of that. Thanks. But, but it does move the needle, so it's. It's, it's meaningful, yeah. I imagine. Yeah. Melissa, well, can you please call roll? Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried to adopt the resolution transferring interest earned to the sinking fund in the amount of $56,769. Out of Mr. Miller's favorite, the prevailing wage resolution by the is recommended by the business office. Is there a motion to approve a resolution ascertaining the prevailing rate of wages for laborers, workers, and mechanics employed on public works? of the Downers Grove Grade School District 58, that the resolution be filed with the Department of Labor of the State of Illinois, and that a notice of the resolution and a hyperlink to the prevailing wages schedule for DuPage County be published on the district's website. So moved. Second. Discussion? This is, this is mandated by the state. 
Yeah, it's that weird, it's a weird situation that we're mandated by the state to do it, yet we're required to uh, vote on it. So uh, as, as Mr. Miller brought up earlier, like what happens if we say no, no one really knows, but. Uh, I see. The state mandates that we pay a certain pay wage. Pay the prevailing wage, but we have to vote, vote on, what, on it anyway. On what that is, yeah. In all of your bids, it requires, you know, yeah. if there's a prevailing wage for those jobs, that those be paid and that the contractor be covered under that piece, as according to state statute. How are those wages determined? The state sets them. The state Department of Labor establishes by county what the prevailing current prevailing wages in that county for certain jobs. And it's a very long list. Yeah. The full spreadsheet is attached. Yeah, I saw that. Melissa, right. will you please call roll? Member Weiner. Aye. Yes. Member Joshi. He. Yes. I said aye. <laughs> aye. Member Hannes. Aye. <laughs> Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried to approve the resolution ascertaining the prevailing rate of wages for laborers, workers, and mechanics employed on public works of Downers Grove Grade School District 58, that the resolution be filed with the Department of Labor of the State of Illinois, and that a notice of the resolution and a hyperlink to the prevailing wage schedule for DuPage County be published on the district's website. We have a food services contract recommended by the business office. Is there a motion to approve the contract for a second year renewal for food service management with Aramark for the 2019-2020 school year for a maximum increase of 2.8%? So moved. Second. Is this, a, is this a competitive bid as well? <laughs> it is a competitive bid uh, that is bid um, it has to be bid every five years. It is very structured and established by the state that it has to be a low bid format according to the state statutes and structure that the ISB uh, staff um, regulate. And this is a renewal of that contract. Uh, it can only increase by <coughs> consumer price index for home from food away, which is 2.8%. And therefore, that is the increase um, given all the parameters. So. Who's, who are the other players in this space besides Aramark? Sodexo. 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 There's, there are, uh, there's a variety of other companies, a yeah. dozen companies or so in the state. Okay. Any other discussion? Right. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried to approve the contract for a second year renewal for food service management with Aramark for the 2019-2020 school year for a maximum increase of 2.8%. Next up is the reimbursable lunch cost recommended by the business office. Is there a motion to approve that the cost of, for the reimbursable paid lunch be set at $2.90 for the 2019-2020 school year? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried to approve the cost for the reimbursable paid lunch to be set at $2.90 for the 2019-2020 school year. We now have a bid for waste removal as recommended by the business office. Is there a motion to award? Uh, the bid for waste removal and recyclable services to Flood Brothers for an approximate annual cost of $37,529.10. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All right. Melissa, please call roll. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member <coughs> Weiner. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried to award the bid for waste removal and recyclable service to Flood Brothers for an approximate annual cost of $37,529.10. We now have a bid for playground mulch as recommended by the business office. Is there a motion to award the bid for playground mulch installation to Trees R Us Inc. for an approximate total cost of $42,975? So moved. Second. Any discussion? I have a question. Um, 
Does every school get this every year? Because I, I don't see it for. So not every school has mulch. Uh, for instance, Highland and Bel Air still have pea gravel. Thank you, that, that explains what I didn't see. So it's not every location, but yes, this is a typical summer or late spring expenditure for the moment. So there's two schools left that have pea gravel? Um, it's a mix. For instance, yeah. Kingsley has some areas that are mulch and some areas that are pea gravel. So it's still, it's still a mix across the district. Is Fairmont, Fairmont does not have pea gravel anymore? Fairmont still has one section of pea one gravel. One section, yes. Okay. Any other questions? All right, Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Simanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried to award the bid for playground mulch installation to Trees R Us Inc. for an approximate total cost of $42,975. We also have a bid for miscellaneous painting recommended by the business office. Is there a motion to award the bid? for miscellaneous painting to Allied Painting Services, Inc., for a cost of $27,500 and an alternates of $750 for five flagpoles and $25 for each additional door frame. So move. Second. Any discussion? No, but I just wanted to point out that back in the late 80s when I painted for the district, I only got paid three dollars and eighty cents. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a good step up for those professional painters. <laughs> Did you have professional painting skills? I do now. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, so, you please call roll. Oh, oh. I, I have, so all all the, all thirteen schools are getting touch ups or paint, like certain classrooms, hallways, gyms. It, not every space gets painted but all 13 schools will be painted to a certain extent. High priority areas in all the buildings. Depends on need. It depends on what? On the need. Need. On the quality and what needs to be. It would be very expensive, obviously, to paint all walls across the district, but it also then would to require all everything taken off the walls oh, to yes. paint them. So. This, is, this is maybe getting in the weeds a little bit, but do, is uh, high priority, is it like, where like the paint's peeling off or something, or correct. We we uh, we do walkthroughs. Principals and custodians identify. Uh, we verify the, those maps so we can send those as supplemental information. That went they they went out in the bid the maps for each school. Does it matter what color it is? Uh, to, <laughs> I'm, I'm just the asking. The cost does not matter which color it is. No. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Do you have a preference on color, Tracy? <laughs> well, if it was in a teacher's room, I was just curious if the teacher gets to have a say on if they want to have a splash of color in their room. Is that possible? I believe they picked from. I think the color changes were allowed more in the past, and we were trying to uh, minimize that this year the best we could in an attempt for some cost savings. And so, primarily. The things that were bid this year are what needs to be. Gotcha. Thank you. Anything else? All right, Melissa, please go roll. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried to award the bid for miscellaneous painting to Allied Painting Services Inc. for a cost of twenty seven thousand five hundred dollars and the alternates of $750 for five flagpoles and $25 for each additional door frame. We also have a bid for print and design services as recommended from, by the business office. Is there a motion to award the bid for a one-year contract for design and printing services to Kelvin Press Inc. for an approximate cost of $18,094.06 with the option to extend for two additional years? So moved. Second. All right, any discussion? I would just point out um, that the current vendor for this service did not bid on this um, in response to this request. Um, so this is a change. We've been with the Macklin Group for quite a while. 
Um, so we likely will see some change in design to some of our print work. Um, we're excited to see what that might look like. It will take a little more um, time and uh, collaboration probably from Megan with the new print uh, people to, to redesign and, and look at some of those, those print options. But um, the community can look forward to maybe a, a new look at our annual report and some of those uh, print materials that go out as a result. So we're, we're kind of excited about that new opportunity as well. Questions? All right, Melissa, please call roll. Member Samati? Aye. Member Weiner? Aye. Member Doshi? Aye. Member Hannes? Aye. Member Harris? Aye. Member Olchik? Aye. Member Hughes? Aye. Motion carried to award the bid for a one year contract for design and printing services to Kelvin Press Inc. for an approximate cost of $18,094.06 with the option to extend for two additional years. We have a recommendation for a truck purchase as recommended by the Director of Buildings and Grounds. Is there a motion to approve the purchase of one 2019 Ford F-250 truck from Curry Motors in Frankfort, Illinois through the Suburban Purchasing Cooperative Contract number 178 at a cost of $36,576? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Um, just curious, I, how we how do we determine that Curry Motors would be like our target dealership that we would go find uh, for F two fifty? Like, how do we kind of narrow it down to that specific location you know, and model? It's through the Suburban Purchasing Cooperative okay. and Curry Motors. Um, the Northwest Municipal Conference um, manages that Suburban Purchasing, Purchasing Cooperative, and Curry Motors is the one that won their bid. The North okay. Northwest Conference. Right, thanks. I, I would also point out because I did receive a couple of questions from board members um, that this purchase is out of this year's fiscal budget, the buildings and grounds budget. Um, and secondly, after summer usage, and it's mentioned in the memo, but just to point it out, uh, one of the older vehicles will be re requested to be designated as surplus equipment in the fall and then posted for sale from there. Any other discussion? All right, Melissa, please go roll. Member Hannes? Aye. Member Harris? Aye. Member Olchik? Aye. Member Samanti? Aye. Member Weiner? Aye. Member Doshi? Aye. Member Hughes? Aye. Motion carried to approve the purchase of one 2019 Ford F-250 truck from Curry Motors in Frankfort, Illinois through the Suburban Purchasing Cooperative, contract number 178 at a cost of $36,576. We have up for second reading policies number 2001, 2002, 2020, 2031, 2032, 2042, 2043, 5121, and 5131.1 as recommended by the Policy Committee. Is there a motion to adopt revisions to the policies number 2001, Goals and Objectives, number 2002, Organizational Chart, number 2020, Deputy Superintendent, number 2031, Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum and Instruction, number 2032, Assistant Superintendent for Personnel, number 2042, Manager of Business Services, number 2043, a super, Assistant Superintendent of Technology, Number 5121, search and seizure. Number 5131.1, bus, bus conduct. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried to adopt revisions to policies number 2001, 2002, 2020, 2031, 2032, 2042, 2043, 5121, and 5131.1. We also have a second reading for deletion of policy number 2030.5, controller as recommended by the policy committee. Is there a motion to delete the policy 2030.5, controller? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Remind me, is this one just redundant with the treasurer? Role this is what we don't have this position. We just don't have the positions. All, right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried to delete policy number 2030.5, controller. Next up, we have our announcements. So we have a, a few dates to go over. We have our middle school promotion ceremonies. Both take place on June 10th, 2019. O'Neill's will be at 5 p.m. 
and Herrick's uh, will be at 7 p.m., both taking place at Downers Grove South. Uh, the last day of school will be June 11th, 2019, and it will be a half day of student attendance. And then our next regular board meeting will be July 8th, 2019, at 7 p.m., right here at Village Hall. The board will now meet in closed session. Is there a motion to move to closed session to discuss the appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees of the district, 5 ILCS 122C1, collective negotiating matters between the district and its employees or their representatives for deliberations concerning salary schedules for one or more classes of employees, 5 ILCS 122C2, student disciplinary cases, 5 ILCS 122C9, the placement of individual students into special education programs and other matters relating to individual students, 5 ILCS 122C10, litigation when an action against affecting or on behalf of the district has been filed and is pending before a court or administrative tribunal, or when the district finds that an action is probable or imminent in which the case the basis of the finding shall be recorded and entered into the closed meeting minutes, 5 ILCS 122C11. Discussion of minutes lawfully closed under the Open Meetings Act, whether for the purpose of approval by the body of minutes or a semi-annual review of the minutes as mandated by Section 2.06, 5 ILCS 122C21. So moved. Second. Uh, any discussion? All right, Melissa, please call roll. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Um, motion is carried uh, to go into closed session. Uh, we will meet at what time is it? About 9 10.